you're enjoying the pizza. I know you're going to enjoy the presentation. Um, this is the Tiber team. And Tiber design, so I call them Tiger. I think it's misspelling. Um, they designed a liquid rocket engine and a facility, test facility. Has anyone seen it? Oh, so you have a, you have a fan base. Um, I encourage you to smell the liquid, uh, burnt liquid engine over there. It's waking up. Um, in, in my opinion, in, the, in our opinion, um, usually you compliment at the end of the presentation, but I can't help myself. Uh, this team raised the bar for all the capstone projects. That's, that's my opinion. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over. All right, um, good morning. Welcome to our portion of this design symposium. Thank you so much for coming and uh, letting us share what we've worked on this academic year with you. Over the past year, our project, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Osman was right. It, it did raise the bar a little bit. We um, designed and built a liquid rocket engine and the accompanying test facility, uh, which is basically the first project of its kind on this campus, working off of some legacy projects. And this test facility, it not only accommodates our liquid rocket engine, but supports future projects. And we'll be able to increase the scope of the projects that future capstone teams will be able to create. Uh, this is a new era of development in the liquid rocket program at Embry-Riddle, not just at the Prescott campus, but also at the Daytona Beach campus. Uh, making it one of just a handful of universities that offers this kind of program to its students, most especially as undergraduates. So I'll introduce the team that worked on this. Uh, in this picture from left to right, we have Matt Bobbin. Uh, Matt Bobbin was responsible for developing the ablative chamber of our rocket engine and also implementing some of our instrumentation and wiring harnesses. Uh, we also have Robert Myers, who was responsible for designing our propellant tanks and played an integral part in installing our propellant feed system. Uh, in the picture kneeling is Cameron Kurtz. Cameron was responsible for designing the engine that we were testing, and he also wrote the data acquisition code that we wrote in LabVIEW uh, so we can take test data. Daniel Dick is next. He designed the feed system and uh, basically installed all of it. Um, Daniel is super awesome and uh, has been uh, one, of the, the, one of the key technical uh, driving members on this team. Um, myself, my name is Rachel Rise. Um, I served as a design team lead, basically filing all the paperwork and um, also leading the design of the electrical system, instrumentation, data acquisition, and control, all the hardware that went into that. Uh, Ahmad Bagnitham was uh, a very versatile team member. He supported a lot of auxiliary tasks that didn't necessarily tie into one particular subsystem and really helped uh, make sure all of those other tasks got done um, that weren't specifically tied to that, that one subsystem. And finally, Lucas Weider was responsible for um, infrastructure installation, making sure that the uh, testing facility interfaced well with the surrounding area. And he also designed and implemented the thrust takeout system. So with that, we'll jump right into the details of our project. So I would like to uh, introduce the main delivery of this project, which is Janus. Uh, Janus is a liquid rocket engine, was designed and built for uh, Eagle Aerospace to participate in Far Mars competition to reach an altitude of 45,000 feet. Uh, Janus is a liquid rocket engine that uses fuel, uh, uses jet air as its fuel, and it uses liquid oxygen as an, as an oxidizer for it. And there we have a little coyote for scale in that picture. Uh, the, main, the secondary delivery of this project is TSL-3. TSL-3 came in very handy uh, to support the liquid program on campus. Last semester there was a project called Mercury Propulsion. It was a capstone project. We have some of the audience that worked on that project too. Uh, everything, uh, that, uh, the, we, everything has to be done in TSL-1. And TSL-1 was just uh, a concrete pit in the ground. And it was really hard to work on it. It was a project that was three by six foot. It was really small and it was not weatherproof. Everything has to be taken apart by the end of the day to keep the implementation safe and protected. Uh, as you can see, Tesla 3 is fully enclosed and it could be fully covered from the rain and the weather. Uh, we actually done some cold flows while it was raining, so they were supposed to do it and supported us. 
quick question on the main review what inside Tesla 3 is mainly the uh, you, see, you have the three parts you have the feed system the thrust takeouts and then the uh, DAC box the feed system contains the liquid oxygen tanks as well as the fuel tanks and the plumbing that will be feeding the uh, propellants into the engine itself uh, then you have the thrust takeouts that will be holding Janus itself and you'll be measuring the thrust and make sure it stays in place and also we have the DAC box or the instrumentation box uh, we, we, we made it modular even though it doesn't look like it, but all you have to do is just disconnect the harnesses and you're good to go. We made it specifically like that so when it's taken to, uh, to compete in farm parts competition, it will be easy to move. I will now discuss an overview of the Janus rocket engine. Janus is designed to meet the requirements of the Far Mars competition <coughs> guidelines. At 1,000 pounds of thrust, the engine can provide a high enough thrust to weight ratio that the vehicle itself can be passively fin stabilized. The combustion chamber is ablatively cooled to keep it both simple and lightweight. The injector is a lock centered pintle injector, which uses Jet A as fuel and obviously locks as an oxidizer. Jet A was selected as a fuel because of its high specific impulse and because it is readily available to us here from the Embry Riddle flight line. The injector also features a film cooling jacket as a secondary cooling method, and the engine itself is designed to operate at a chamber pressure of about 300 psi, which is a limit imposed by the flight vehicle tanks because the flight vehicle has a weight restriction, obviously. Janus is an ablatively cooled rocket engine, which means the combustion chamber is designed to erode during engine operation. The ablated material of choice for Janus's chamber is silica fiber, which we laminated with a high temperature epoxy. Uh, we laminated it over <coughs> an aluminum mandrel and then put it in an oven to cure. Um, the, the design for this ablative chamber has evolved several times over the course of the months that we were prototyping. And we initially, initially had some problems with the, the silica fibers delaminating because there was poor um, poor penetration of the epoxy into the silica fibers, and also because our initial silica supplier, the silica we used, had an adhesive backing which prevented the epoxy from bonding the layers together adequately. To fix these problems, we did vacuum, we did pre-infusion pre of epoxy into the silica and also vacuum bagged it, and we fixed the adhesion issue by changing suppliers. Uh, here we see a final iteration of the ablative chamber. After a 24 hour room temperature cure, it looks like the white image on the left. And then after the 13 hour oven cure, it looks like the image in the center. Following this oven cure, we then post machine it to meet the dimensions of the design engine. So we cut it down to length and also modify the diameter to fit the chamber plan. The uh, first prototype that we made using this method was cut in half and a piece of it is being passed around. We cut it in half so we could examine the cross section for voids, which would indicate uh, poor uh, vacuum bagging equipment. And we also use these halves for some destructive testing. One, to see how the internal structure fails under, um, under, under stress loads. And also we put one of the halves on our thrust takeout system and we pumped cryogenic fluid through it to see how it reacts to thermal shock. Once the combustion chamber is completed, it is mated to the injector using a chamber flange, which is shown here. The chamber flange is bonded to the ablative chamber using a high temperature adhesive. Because the ablative itself is not designed to be a pressure vessel, we then wrap the chamber with filament, a carbon fiber filament using a filament winder. The carbon fiber filament is pre-impregnated with resin, so once the wrap is completed, we then bring it back to campus and do an oven cure for about four hours. The chamber flange is designed with a bump so that as the carbon fiber is wrapped around the, the flange itself and the chamber, it holds the two pieces securely together and they can't separate when the engine is experiencing pressure. <laughs> so, as mentioned previously, the engine is a lock-centered pintle injector. Um, here's a cap cross-section of the engine, um, just to basically review how it actually works. Um, note the green arrow is the path the liquid oxygen takes into the injector itself. 
Um, it's oxygen centered, so the oxygen enters the center of the engine into the pintle, where it is injected radially um, to the rest of the engine. Um, the fuel enters the engine through, um, at least through the main um, fuel plant, um, two symmetric fuel ports, um, where it is <coughs> and then distributed across the distribution ring to ensure symmetric annular flow. It then is developed into an annulus where it uh, basically flows along the pintle itself um, where it impinges at 90 degrees to the radially directed oxygen jets. There's also a separate um, plenum or pocket or cavity inside the injector itself um, for film cooling. The purpose of this is to allow the team to change the pressure inside this plenum and therefore change the mass flow rate. Um, because there's a lot of unknowns with the ablative and it's going to help us solve problems and basically keep the life of the ablative uh, long enough for flight. Um, so just to emphasize again what a pencil uh, injector is, um, the upper image you can see are the radially directed jets. Um, this is the image we took in the test cell. It is a nitrogen flow, and you can see all 12 jets flowing um, radially. And then beneath that is the annular flow. This is an image of a water flow test. Uh, the real one would be with jet egg, which is a breath of kerosene. So you can basically imagine both of them running simultaneously, creating a cone of flame downstream of the pencil. So the first component that we machined was the pencil itself. The pintle uh, was machined from C110 copper because copper has a significantly higher holding conductivity than most other materials. And this will help us will help the pintle actively cool itself uh, due to the liquid oxygen being inside the pintle and vector way of heat and combustion, which is surrounding the pintle. Uh, you can also see the radially directed orifices in the Teflon seal, which is used to seal the oxygen uh, <coughs> while the engine is uh, pressurized, as well as the drive tool, which is used to untorque torque the pintle um, for assembly and disassembly. The second component that was made was the pintle post. Um, this is the component that the pintle threads into. Uh, this is actually where we have one of the major problems uh, on the project. Um, and uh, the pintle post is where the fluid connections are on the heat system, or on the <coughs> engine, and so it's where the heat system interfaces with the engine so that the engine can then receive propellant. And as you can see in the left-hand image, uh, there is uh, ex excessive, uh, the heating from the welding um, <coughs> caused excessive warping, and this resulted in the pintle post not being able to fit onto the CNC lathe again to finish the final machining ops. And was, the part was almost scrapped, which would have been a big delay, but uh, working with uh, campus machinists, um, we tried saving it. And we did that by putting it in an oven and heating it up to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit to reduce the residual stresses caused by the welding process, as well as it also reduced the yield strength. And so once that was reduced and a little hot, we then put it in a hydraulic press and pushed it back to nominal. Uh, once we did that, uh, it was nominal enough where we could put it back into the <coughs> lathe and we were able to finish the final machining ops. Here is the finished product um, with the safe pintle post and the pintle threaded onto it. You can see the drive tool. The second component, or the next component, first component, that was machined was the base plate. This is the component which manifolds the fuel. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the inner main plenum, and the left and outwards of that, you can see the separate film cooling plenum. And the left hand side is the bottom of the base plate. This is the side which sees combustion. Uh, here you can also see the small film cooling holes as well as the holes which are used for tapping. That are tap holes used to mount the film cooling jacket. And the final two components are the distribution ring, which is used to <coughs> symmetric fuel as it enters the annulus, as well as the film cooling jacket, which is to aid recirculating zones of combustion, as well as protect the film cooling orifices before they uh, encounter these hot recirculating zones at the combustion chamber. And once all of these components are made, uh, we are finally able to assemble the entire thing. And this is the complete injection <coughs> with the pencil threaded onto the pencil post, the face plate, uh, with the film cooling jacket, and uh, threaded onto the face plate. Now, to start Janus, we have chosen to use SDC 6 0 solid rocket motors. And we are starting it by inserting these motors <coughs> into the throat using this 3D printed igniter holder, um, which then, once Janus fully starts, is shot out of the nozzle and is tethered to the test cell so it doesn't cause a hazard. 
and you can see the solid rocket motor is pointed at a slight angle, and so that's so it can point downwards into the chamber and ignite any cooled propellant that may have gotten there during our chilling process. Um, and we've tested this multiple times, and using those little metal clips, we were able to fine tune the amount of force it takes for that to pop out so that it will stay in there while the solid rocket motor fires, but then exit once Janus fully fires. And now moving on to the test cell where we're testing Janus in, um, we're gonna talk about how it got from an empty Connex box to the full facility that we have today. So it was delivered on January 23rd, 2019, and moved into its final place on January 25th onto some concrete pads that the facilities had laid out for us. And it was delivered with several modifications already installed. We had a man door installed that you can see on the left image, <coughs> as well as a roll-up garage door on the opposite side, and then some vents along the upper walls and ceiling, as well as structural reinforcements underneath the floor where the engine will be mounted. Um, they can support the thrust of the engine with some mounting rails that we can mount all our systems to. Within a few days of delivery, we'd already started installing some things such as our storage shelves and our tools that you can see in the image on the right. And then we began moving into our full subsystem installation. This is installing the thrust takeout system, which is the red bit there. And then the tank mounting structure to hold our propellant tanks, as well as our pressure transducer box that's in the top of these images with the caution tape on it. This houses our pressure transducers at a safe location above the engine um, and routes its wiring out of the way. And the thrust takeout system itself is designed to support 3,000 pound thrust engines with a factor of safety of two with up to 10% off axis thrust to allow for gimbling to occur if a future team wants to accomplish that. There are a series of mounting holes on that vertical plate that allow for different sized engines to be mounted to those load cells using an adapter plate. Our adapter plate for Janus is the gray circle shown there, and that is the only component of the thrust takeout system specifically designed for each engine, so that way the rest of the system can be reused. It's a simple water jet cut piece with the full pattern of our engine. And this system is bolted to those rails I was talking about earlier along the floor, which are welded to reinforced floor structure underneath. There is also diamond plate steel coating the floor, which provides additional protection against liquid oxygen spills. Some other things we've done in the test cell um, are we need, obviously, power and data connections. So facilities added a post that has 110 volt power outlets on it, and then a conduit running back to building 91 that we put eight ethernet cables and four video cables in. These cables are used to transfer our data for our data acquisition and our control systems, and the video cables run to four security cameras mounted throughout the test cell so we can safely monitor testing. Building 91 is our block house or our control room during testing, so we need to be able to monitor our tests from in there while we're testing. Moving, um, the data cables and video cables run from that post through a sheath into our test cell where they run along a cable tray, which you can see in the top of the center image, which keeps all those cables out of the way and takes them to our data acquisition box, as well as some of our other sensors. Below that cable tray, you can see we have workbenches and a full set of tools so teams can work on their projects in the test cell rather than having to go back and forth to our propulsion lab, which would be very inefficient time-wise. On the opposite side of the container, we have some storage shelves, and at the end of those shelves are a, or is a water flow test stand, which has, is in the photo on the right, and it has a large water tank which can be pressurized to flow water through feed system components to test them. This water flow test stand was also multi-purpose as a water deluge system or a fire suppressant system. Now this was done by a team off the water tank, routing PVC pipe over to the rest of the test stand, adding a actuator and a sprinkler to the end of the PVC pipe. Now this way, if there are small fires in the test stand, they can be remotely, the water deluge system can be remotely opened and water can be sprayed on these fires. Uh, another important part of the test stand is the tanks and their infrastructure. Uh, these were installed by first bolting the lower section of the infrastructure <coughs> into the L brackets on the bottom of the conics. Uh, then each tank 
was lifted up and set on load cells on this mounting structure. And then the top of the mounting structure was attached and everything was secured together uh, so these tanks could uh, stand there by themselves. On the left picture, you can see a steel plate we added to one side of this. Uh, this is to provide blast protection to our propellant, propellant tanks in the event of an engine explosion. Uh, you can also see on the right, we have the data acquisition box mounted on the opposite side of the propellant tanks. Uh, another key part of this feed system is the muscle pressure and the press pressure circuit. On the left, you can see one of the panels that controls this. This takes uh, pressurized nitrogen that we get delivered in bottles and regulates it down to press our liquid oxygen tanks, our fuel tanks, and also to provide muscle pressure, which is the pneumatic pressure delivered to pneumatic actuators to open some of our valves. Uh, you can see gauges for nitrogen pressure uh, in the bottles, the panel pressure, uh, LOX tank pressure, fuel tank pressure, muscle pressure, and also manual relief valves on the top. Uh, on the right, you can see some of our half-inch tubing we use to press the liquid oxygen and fuel tanks. Uh, this is a picture, picture of our liquid oxygen run line. Uh, this provides liquid oxygen to the engine from the liquid oxygen tanks. Uh, in the front, or in the, the right side of the picture, you can see our fill line, and a little bit behind that, at an angle, you can see one of our cryogenic actuators. Uh, you can see that it has a long neck. This is to separate the actuator from the cryogenic fluid, so it provides uh, a thermal barrier between the two. This is a picture of our fuel run line. It's in the, the front of the picture. You can see the LOX run line a little bit in the back. Uh, the main difference between this and the LOX run line, uh, besides providing fuel instead of liquid oxygen, is that it is not cryogenic, and it also has an additional uh, run line that provides film cooling to the engine. Uh, there's also an orifice in here in this run line that will modulate uh, the M dot uh, and the, the fuel film cooling that the engine receives. The data acquisition box is designed to be a self-contained system for interfacing between the instrumentation of our test cell and our data collection system. This includes power supplies, the control Arduino, the National Instruments DAC chassis, valve relays, and DIN terminals, which we use to cleanly distribute power to instrumentation. These connectors terminate at the edge of the box with 37-pin circular pin connectors, which allows instrumentation <coughs> to be disconnected from the box so that it can be transported to different test sites if we need to perform a test that can be performed in our facility. An Ethernet harness also connects the box to Building 91, which is our block house, so that we can remotely actuate valves, manually start or abort the auto sequence, and also monitor the feed system through a graphical user interface. Test L3 has a permanently integrated instrumentation system consisting of 12 pressure transducers, 6 thermocouples, 13 valve actuators with 13 valve state talkbacks, 10 load cells, and four security cameras. All of these harnesses that travel within the vicinity of the feed system and test article are uh, shrouded in an abrasion and flame-resistant sleeving. Our pressure transducers are used to measure such things as tank pressure and chamber pressure or muscle pressure, among many other things that are needed to safely operate the facility. The thermocouples measure various temperatures so that we can know when the feed system is chilled, for example. The load cells are used both to measure engine thrust and tank mass, and the remote cameras are used to so that we can safely um, observe the test article and the feed system and clear it of personnel when we are remotely performing tests from the blockhouse. So in order to collect data, a, a lab view code is developed. Um, there are three tabs to this lab view code. This is the first tab. Here is a still image of the LabVIEW code not running. Um, it is essentially just a simplified version of our feed system. Um, here you can see um, the production tanks, fuel tanks, um, tubes, valves, bottles, um, just like it is in our feed system. And the point is to make it representative of what it is in real life. Um, and this also has all the relevant pressures, temperatures, and forces um, in their respective locations so it's easy to look at and debug uh, when you're actually running tests. 
There are also uh, basic controls on the Elagi code, such as toggling writing data or not writing data, tearing your tanks, choosing whether or not you want to be using or displaying both fuel tanks or both liquid oxygen tanks or just one, clearing the status, um, and then just other basic indicators. Um, here is another still image of the lab recode um, as if it was running. Uh, here you can see the tubes and the valve lighting up um, accordingly to as if there's propellant actually in them. And it lights it up as if it's as if there's actually propellant in them. So blue in this case would be nitrogen, uh, green is oxygen, and orange is fuel. The second tab is the tab with charts, and this is basically the same thing as the first tab, but it just displays all the data in chart form. So if you want to watch your data and over a period of time to verify if it has plateaued or not, this is where you would do it. So there's two separate charts for pressure, both of them are indicated in blue. The upper right one displays the mass flow rate from the Venturi's live, the bottom, bottom right one displays the temperatures um, live as well, while simultaneously giving you a very low refresh rate for this chart so you can basically speed or slow down how quickly the chart shows you the data that's coming in. And then the final tab on the lab you code is uh, setups and aborts. And so on the leftmost side, it displays all the channels that are being read on the, on the deck box. There are being 36 channels, uh, probably not shown because it's a still image. In the center of this, this tab is where you set up the abort criteria. Here you would basically click and select which channels you deem are necessary for <coughs> setting up abort parameters. An example is currently shown where the chamber pressure is less than 100 PSI. Um, save the test cell and throw in abort. So this, the lab code would look for aborts during the auto sequence, and if at any point that condition became true, the test cell would be saved. And then the final, on the far right, is just more set up, set of conditions for the user to specify how much propellant that was in the tank from previous tests to allow the user to have an updated uh, PNID on the panel. So moving after that in our testing, we have three main testing roles, uh, starting with TCON, which is time for test conductor. Uh, TCON is the person who's responsible about running the whole test campaign and he's the person who has like a go or no go test, whether it's safe or not to perform a test. And then we have the DAC and checklist uh, personnel, who basically is the person uh, responsible about watching the, da the data coming from the lab view, making sure we are sitting within our red lines and nothing's going over crazy. And also, he's also giving commands to red team and TCON. Uh, then we have red team. Red team is like a team of two people, where the two people are the closest to the danger line all the time. But there are the people who are dealing with the tanks and pressurizing and filling locks and fuel into the system. Safety has been one of our main priorities during the whole time, personnel and equipment as well. Uh, as you can see, when it comes to handling cryogenics, the red team is asked to put in having proper clothes and having also uh, cryogenic gloves. Also, one of the very first cold clothes, we had campus safety do a enrichment test to make sure that we don't have any small leaks of liquid oxygen or even oxygen that we couldn't detect. Uh, also, safety is still being more, uh, we also have more safety during the procedures. For example, you can see that we have one of the commands to ask red team to put in their face shields. Also, to make TCON make sure that all the, all the valves and the, and the bottoms, everything is backed off. And also, we have one of the commands when they come to pressurize the system to open the bottle slowly to avoid, to avoid any adiabatic expansion which might cause an explosion in the fuel lines and hurt the red team itself. <coughs> So before I actually begin talking about the testing we did, I'd like to introduce our flow control device. We use something known as cavitating venturis, which is a mechanically simple device that accelerates the flow of the fluid to the point where the static pressure drops below the vapor pressure. This causes cavitation at the throat, which creates dual phase flow, and this dual phase flow drops the speed of sound to the order of tens of meters per second. We now have choked flow at the throat, which establishes a constant mass flow rate, and uh, decouples the upstream pressure from the downstream pressure in case you have oscillations in chamber pressure, you're not transmitting it back upstream. In the left photo, you can see a transparent um, cavitating venturi, which shows the vapor region where it's actually cavitating. And in the top right corner, you can see uh, a cross-section of our venturi, 
And in the bottom right corner is the actual machine venturi. So the very first test we ran was flowing liquid nitrogen through the liquid oxygen side of our feed system. This is because we wanted to find out the problems in our liquid oxygen uh, side of the feed system with a much safer propellant. In this case, liquid oxygen or liquid nitrogen. It's also cryogenic, slightly colder, um, but it's chemically inert. And so we were able to learn things about the facility, such as if we had any cryogenically caused leaks. We learned how to chill in the facility, where we actually bring the, the plumbing down to temperatures where we're not instantly boiling off the li uh, cryogenic liquid into gas. And we learned that our um, pressure system has a 10% drop uh, through the flow. In this test, you can see that liquid nitrogen flowing through the pintle, and we conducted uh, six of these liquid nitrogen cold flows. Um, we also verified the operation of our fabricating maturities with these tests by comparing the predicted mass flow rates to the load cell um, mass measurements underneath the tanks. Once we felt comfortable with the uh, liquid oxygen side of the feed system, we moved on to liquid oxygen cold flows. This allowed us to verify operation and mass flow rates with our actual oxidizer, um, liquid oxygen. We conducted a, a, an additional six of these tests. Then we moved on to the fuel side of our system. Here um, you can see a water flow of the fuel side. We use water for the same reason we use liquid nitrogen on our liquid oxygen cold flows. It's a, a safe flow to use, but similar enough to uh, jet fuel. Um, this allowed us to, with the, during these, this test series, we found some problems with our control code and our uh, control electronics, which we were able to fix, and we all were also able to fix leaks in the system. Once we were confident with the water side of our feed system, we moved on to uh, jet flows, and so this allowed us to get some experience actually handling jet a uh, more hazardous fluid. Um, and also verify that uh, we're getting proper mass flow rates and figure out our regulator set pressures. We conducted two of these tests. Finally, we get to test series five, which are our sequence cold flows. These are my favorite and arguably the most important. Um, these tests allowed us to figure out the sequencing and timing of events like valve openings and ignition in order to um, figure out to, how, how to properly start the engine. Um, it, it is extremely critical that you get all these timings right, um, otherwise you can blow up the engine like we did last year. Um, <laughs> so we wanted to make sure we got it right this time. So we were shooting for a sequence where we do three seconds of injector chill or injector prime, where we flow high flow rate liquid oxygen through the injector in order to bring the plumbing downstream of our main valves down to that chill temperature where it's not instantly boiling off the liquid oxygen into gas. We then stand down so that we can turn on our igniter without high flow liquid oxygen hitting it. And then um, we start the igniter. Roughly a quarter second after starting the igniter, we leave with liquid oxygen. Um, the reason we leave with liquid oxygen is because if you leave with fuel and you don't uh, ignite it or you're not having combustion, you can have fuel pooling in the bottom of the chamber. And so then when you do ignite it, you can cause an explosion. So it's important we leave with liquid oxygen. Then roughly 200 milliseconds after liquid oxygen enters the injector, which we confirmed via video, we wanted a flow of our fuel annulus and our film cooling to start. So to get to that point, it took a lot. Um, I would like to point out that between the delivery of the empty box on January 23rd, there were 50 days until the first cold close, which means we got all of our instrumentation, all of our plumbing, all of our in infrastructure installed in just 50 days. Um, and to do that, it took a lot of hours. Between the seven of us, we worked 5,120 total hours as of last night. That averages to approximately 731 hours per person total. Uh, a couple of us actually hit over 1,000 hours, so uh, big shout out to them. Uh, that also averages to about 150 teen hours per week. Um, some fun maximum stats. Uh, over spring break, most of the team stayed behind, and we were able to put in a total of 305 hours just over spring break alone. And one of our team members uh, maxed out with 64 hours in one week uh, working on this project while being full-time students. 
another reason this project was so successful was because of the immense amount of sponsorship that we got in this project. Um, between the sponsors listed here, Ember Middle College of uh, Engineering, Stellar Exploration, Valworks, Foster Sandback from Far Mars, URI, uh, uh, the Undergraduate Research Institute here at Ember Riddle, Vector Launch down in Tucson, and the Student Campus Enhancement Fund. Uh, the total value of the project totaled nearly $80,000. So thanks to the, that sponsorship from those people, that uh, was a big player in why uh, this project was such a success. We'd also like to take this time to thank our advisor, Dr. Elliot Breiner, who's one of our reviewers today, our capstone advisor, Dr. Virat Okche, uh, and especially our machinists in AxFab, Jared Venata and Jeff Hyatt. Thank you so much. Um, their hours were not included in that, that previous slide, but um, they may have put in nearly as many as some of our team members did. So huge shout out to AxFab uh, for making this project possible. We'd also like to thank the rest of the College of Engineering, uh, other faculty who provided technical guidance and support to us along the way. Uh, we could not have gotten to this point without you. And I think the most important thing was that we had this common goal. We wanted to see Janus mounted on the thrust structure in a functional test cell after cold flows uh, at the end of this year. And that really created a good sense of team cohesion. Uh, and we were able to forgive each other for mistakes that were made because we knew that, um, well, because we knew, uh, I forgive you. Because we knew that this was the goal and that uh, getting into those kind of petty squabbles wasn't worth it in the scope of that, of meeting that goal. Um, so that was one of the most satisfying moments of our project, but perhaps the most satisfying moment was this one. Which was the first successful hot fire test of a liquid rocket in the history of Embry-Riddle. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, 
So we're still working on that. If any of our reviewers or uh, members of the audience have any insight on that, uh, we would very much welcome it. <laughs> because we have no clue. <laughs> um, and I would like to emphasize, again, um, it was 50 days between um, box delivery and the first cold flow. It turns out it was exactly three months, January 23rd to April 23rd, 2019, exactly 90 days, between box delivery and the very first hot fire at Every Riddle. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. So awesome job, guys. I've never seen a uh, project with this type of magnitude previously. Uh, again, my name is Kenny Young. I'm with Boeing Mason, in case you guys may know me, don't know me. Some random stranger they pulled off the street this morning. <laughs> so a couple things. Um, talking to, tell me a little about when you guys were talk, doing the, uh, the fabrication for your silica fiber. You guys mentioned you did some type of uh, a fabrication using an aluminum mantle, and then you essentially sectioned it in half to look for voids. Um, walk me through the process here because one, tell me what the effect of, of voids or some type of defect you have on this type of fabrication. So my concern with finding voids in it was meaning that we didn't have the epoxy fully infused through the wall of the inflator and you could get maybe pressure spikes if you had a large enough void and it suddenly you go to away and you had more, more volume or something like that. Um, <coughs> That, so yeah, here's an example of the cutaway. As you can see, this cutaway doesn't show a lot of voids. There is another cutaway that shows we did have some voids, and we fixed that by improving our manufacturing techniques with the chamber, with the vacuum. 
and also by um, doing a, a different kind of cure, slightly different kind of cure schedule. So how do you guys determine what kind of uh, impregnation that to, to use with your epoxy? Uh, you guys did say you use an epoxy system to inject or impregnate. Uh, how's that? How's that chosen uh, one? And then how did you guys determine? Hey, let's just throw it through and out and then get what kind of cure do you guys use? We got some technical advice from somebody who had done it before, and also we experimented several times with different how, like, the, if you go back to the original slide picture, it shows we have poor penetration of the epoxy. Um, next one. Okay. Yeah, so this one, we simply, what we did is we would, we, pull, uh, we used paintbrushes to paint basically the resin onto the mandrel and then force the, force the silica strips onto it. And this happened, so that was a no-go. So what we decided to do instead is actually pre-infuse the epoxy. So we would lay out the strips in a, in a baking pan, basically, pour the epoxy into it and work it into the strip so it was fully, the strip was fully wetted out. And then with compression and heat, it would fully, basically, it would penetrate all the way through and make a, a single monolithic um, chamber instead of having these, the lamination between the layers. So did you guys envelope back that then prior to throwing it to the oven? Uh, yes, it was 24 hours under vacuum, then we pulled it off the vacuum and put it in the oven. 24 hours under ambient? 24 hours at ambient? ambient, yep. That was the resin, the resin manufacturer's uh, recommended schedule. Okay. Uh, second question here. Go to slide 13 real fast. Okay, so this is maybe a minor nuance. Uh, on the right there you say 60 cal deformation. Uh, it's a lot easier just to put a numerical value to that versus spelling that and saying 60 thousandths. I'm assuming 60 thousandths of uh, an inch, not million. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was, it was <coughs> also like 10 30 last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so under, understand, recognize that. Um, just remember in the industry, uh, details do matter for presentations, especially when presented to leadership. I can't tell you the number of times, even just more recently, uh, that when, pre when we get slides in our hands, we like to do math and we like to make sure numbers add up. And if they don't, then the credibility of the presentation and presenter starts to decrease. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I'm not saying that was bad, just food for thought. Okay. Um, second thing, so, so slide 33, and this is maybe a, a me being kind of nitpicky here. Don't like saying that. All right. So you guys spoke to the color of the diagrams of, of, the, of each section within your rock pattern, which is good. Um, I think any presenter should be speaking to the, the graphic. However, annotations within your slides and just general presentation as a whole, um, I think could benefit a lot more from just taking time to add general annotations saying this is what this is, this is, this is what that is. Um, having a color code, you mentioned that blue is if I remember nitrogen, did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just annotate that um, because again, on our slide deck, it's it's pretty small versus oh, okay. how it's being presented. Okay, last thing, um, I want to make sure I get the, the requirements right. So your your chamber is supposed to have a thousand pounds of thrust, correct? The design, yes. The design. Okay, did you guys do any hand calculations to for for predicted load or anything? Uh, what do you mean by the big load? Like actually, like the blood area needs to be, like all that stuff? Correct. So did you just use, use, use uh, literature? We use rock theory analysis. It's a software you can purchase online. Uh, it does all the web speed for you. You can choose different totality. It does a lot of the hard math for you. All right. So go to your test stand. Um, how did you guys determine that your test mount was adequate for your thrust? Yeah, so we did a lot of finite element analysis and CAD um, of, of that thrust takeoff system um, modeling. We mainly used Autodesk and Vector for the non-critical parts, but then ANSYS for the high stress parts, such as the bolts at the base of the thrust structure where it bolts to those rails. Um, and we found most of our components are factors of safety of five plus. It's really the net bolted area that's the only part that gets below a factor of safety of five, so we really wanted to analyze that. Just a simple three by diagram, just a moment equation shown from the camera. But hey, probably not part of what you guys were spoken to do, but I just had to ask. So, um, way cool, I'll turn it over to, to AJ. I, I mean, Dale's an incredible engineer, so you're not a corporation. So, I also want to 
Right, so when this happened, it was pure panic. I posed a practical machinist um, to try and help have people solve the problem. Um, I underestimated how much uh, information the welding would have. Um, if I were to do this again, I might do welding, but I would reduce the fillet size on the actual weld. There's also furnace brazing, which was an option. I intentionally didn't go with that, which is brazing in general, because it's a pretty user error. I don't want someone who does it now necessarily to need two wrenches. They want to back it off and then break off the fitting because it's a braised joint. So, uh, you learn to be diligent and to uh, be careful in welding because things can break. Good lesson on that. I go to slide 23, please. Alright, is there you mentioned that adapter plate on yeah. the takeout system? That's the only thing that changes as the next person comes in. Is there an ICE? or some kind of design specification for the next person that comes in and tries to get that out of the building and get that plate. Yeah, so we are creating an ops manual um, which essentially passes on all of the test cell knowledge the teams will need to know. So in there we have specifications. Um, essentially the only requirements for this adapter plate are it has to interface to the four load cells that you can see around the edges of that adapter plate. And in that red plate, there are a bunch of holes that you can move those load cells around to various positions if the engine has a larger area, or if you're adding a gimbal um, and you need more surface area. Um, but yes, that is all outlined in our office manual. Um, could you also just answer one of my next questions? Because I assume that the lab can do documentation and user guide is included in the ops manual. Yes. Okay. All right, can you jump to slide 31, quick, please? I mentioned during a slide that the Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, each of the instrumentation circuits, so the pressure transducers, load cells, they terminate at the box with CPC connectors, and our ops manual will have instructions on how to do the wire crimping and setting up the harnesses. You interface with that connector, and then inside of the box there is DIN terminal, which, um, let me go back one slide, this picture might show. The DIN terminal allows you to easily add more connections. Um, inside to interface with the NI chassis. So you can just add a simple harness inside, add an internal, and then add the, the extra connection on the CPC on the outside of the box, and then you're ready to go. And there were multiple times during this project where we needed to add more pressure transducers, and it was just a simple thing. Yeah, that's good. That's So we lost the video at the end. Where is that camera located physically? Is it underneath? Mm -hmm. Point it up. Yes. <laughs> so those cameras, they're are they not they're not fixed, are they? You position them where you want them for a test event? Yeah, exactly. So we're using a series of remote cameras, mainly consisting of GoPros and DSLRs. Um, so the GoPros we've been placing closer to the test article, while the DSLRs are farther back. Um, I believe our videos from the hot fires were from the DSLRs. Um, but these GoPros were able to place really close to the test article, and they're durable enough to where getting a little locks on them doesn't hurt. Cool. That's something I think just as far as usage goes, it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve to figure out where to put those, because as soon as the video goes blank, it's not useful to you anymore. I should add that the four security cameras that I, uh, that I mentioned during the instrumentation does not include this. The, the security cameras are permanently fixed 
and locations that allow us to see the test article, the feed system, the tanks, and the most of the most the test cell. This view is not part of this category. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, I've got a chance to play well aerospace. I work in propulsion systems, environmental control systems for aircraft. And I want to congratulate the team, all the contributors. This is really going to be for the university and its campus in terms of uh, setting the table for, for success and, and further uh, you know, further development of its capability. So outstanding, really. Um, I wanted to just make one more maybe general question about uh, design for manufacturing. You guys talked about a couple things, but just uh, maybe more in general, uh, based on what you learned about some of the manufacturing challenges, how would you go back and reflect that into uh, specific changes in design to allow your parts to be more manufacturable? One, one thing for the for the feed system that I would have done back. Um, could you go one more slide? There you go. Um, one thing that I would have realized moving from, if I could go back to prelim, is this gap between the engine adapter plate and the feed system, or the thrust echo, it's just the loads, it's the width of the load cell, and there are around 10, 12 fittings in there that I have to get in there and torque and stuff like that, and in cab land, it's like, oh yeah, I can totally work on that, but when we actually get out there, it's pretty difficult. So I would, next next year or something, you could shim it out maybe, and that would make it a lot easier to work with. So um, a lot of my lessons were with the engine. One of the, probably the biggest issue with the engine is just machining <coughs> all the features into it. And so you have like a lot of options like modular pintles, um, ability to change like the wind mass flow rate, and you've got a bunch of small holes, small cap holes. So if I were to redo it again, I would either remove the option to film pool altogether and hopefully have an ablative that's thick enough to make it easy enough to machine, um, or um, work with machines more to make it easier to make small uh, small Okay, I think it's good that you guys uh, had a lot of applied learning around some of those trade-offs, right? Okay, um, I want to ask a question about the uh, proximity of your fuel and oxidizer tanks. Uh, they're pretty close together. Any concerns about that? Um, so we, we, we thought about this. Uh, <coughs> It, it's it's tricky because um, yeah, optimally you have them far apart, and then uh, your your run lines would come from some areas. But kind of with the with the Conex box architecture, we were kind of forced into having them in right, in the same area next to each other. And with our run lines, we'll have those next to each other uh, inevitably at some point. And those if those leak, then you have the same issues. Um, so the way we, we chose to address this was maximizing the ventilation. So we got a roll-up door installed directly next to these tanks for that reason, so that we can be flowing air in through to displace any vapors. Um, also, with the, we have worthy birds on the top and, and side vents and stuff like that. Um, also, if you run with the scenario with, with one tank going, it'd be very hard to find a place where it doesn't cause the other tank to go, just since pressure vessel explosions are so scary. And um, we address those risks by, we have relief valves at 750 PSI, burst discs at 900 PSI, and we proof tested to a 1,000 PSI. So these were definitely one of our main focuses. Which is why I want redundancy. If you ever get a chance, do yourself a favor, go to Cape Canaveral and go out on a tour of the uh, launch pad. And what you'll find is the liquid hydrogen tank is on one side of the, the complex, and about three miles away, <laughs> the liquid yeah. oxygen tank is on the other side, and there's a good reason for that. Yeah. Now, admittedly, the tanks are a little bit bigger. <laughs> we measured the change in throat diameter to be about a uh, 16th of an inch, and we saw it was about identical in the second test, and those two tests were about the same duration. 
Um, so uh, 67 inches more than we need is, is faster erosion than I would like to see for a full post second hot fire. Um, but it, it took us all semester to get to the point where we could now test the chamber, and now we're seeing that it's not performing as we would like it to. So there is plans to re, like, reevaluate and, and make changes, and possibly do some road inserts or invest in new building materials. Another thing that um, it, we also don't know if that erosion is, is steady state or transient because um, we, we, on startup, we, we kind of set the walls of the chamber on fire and then we start up and that's pretty rough. And so hopefully, um, steady state, the erosion decreases. And so that's one thing to look for. But once these are fired for 12 seconds, your chamber is done um, and you have to build a new one. So they're not reusable. Okay. That's the, that's the point I was kind of getting at. So, uh, as you can see, you can see with the M89. So, yeah, I got it. So, uh, just a general comment, this is kind of going forward uh, as a recommendation. Uh, make sure that uh, between fire and test, you guys have a clearly, or teams that follow you have a clearly uh, spelled out inspection plan, uh, as well as uh, what are we going to do for ongoing maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance of the test apparatus and the facility as a whole. So, it's critically important when you're, when you're running this type of. So we uh, have pre-test procedures that we go through, which include inspections of the like thrust take up, the bolts, which are the most critical part, and like looking at the engine. Um, we take pre-test photos and post-test photos as well. And then um, in between these hot fire attempts, we've been disassembling the engine every time to inspect for melting and O-rings uh, and then things, things like that as well. And then the ops manual includes the more long-term um, uh, maintenance features for the facility, like how often do you have to replace check valves or leak valves, that sort of thing. That's spot on. Thank you. Great job. So, I don't have any questions per se. I just want to say thank you. It's been an honor and pleasure working with you guys for the past year plus. So, great job. Thank you, Dr. Breyer. <laughs> Likewise for the, the guy who's responsible for trying to grow the mechanical engineering program. Do any of the members of the audience have questions? Looking at you, Chad, Amelia. <laughs> What's up? Um, well, I was going to say the panel kissed your ass enough, but no. <laughs> I, I, I will one more. Great job, guys. Uh, it's really phenomenal to see this all come together. Uh, and, and especially in Hollywood fashion, right after last night. So, <laughs> you mentioned a number of times that there are these load cells attached to your engine test stand. Uh, what load? Fitted measure. Ah, uh, can you go to well, which time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. How much trust did it make? So it made around 700 pounds on the first two tests, and then the third test uh, in red. Yeah, it oscillates up around 800, down, up, down, up, and then we measure some noise, maybe 1,200 pounds of noise. Um, and then chamber pressure, we peaked at 250 psi. because that's one of the things we've been thinking about moving forward. And if we wanted to build a relationship with industry uh, where we test things for them, um, we've thought a lot about like how do we prove the accuracy, and, and that's kind of a big open-ended question right now. We've been really focusing on just trying to get the first hot fire, and so if it looks about right, match the same calcs, we've been moving forward, but that is a huge moving forward. We, we can dive into that. Yeah, yeah. No, you've, you've done a really good job in the data. It's definitely coming out. I've seen a lot more. It's all coming out a lot better than most projects, including mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you get down to it, it's it's the reason we test. And so it's an important thing not to overlook in, in my business. It's like literally the only product. So um, it, it's 
it's a good practice and probably in your office plan and things like that, maybe put some future plans for look at this. We don't have time to do it now. Look at this and here's where we need to be. Big list. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Ayers, Dr. Ayers. Oh, I just want to know the other campus and university. Uh, thanks for having me in that nation. It's been too many just so I can for years to come. And uh, it's a great gift for you as you graduate uh, to your campus and to your university. Pretty special, pretty special. Okay. Thank you.